morning, church. So good to see you all today. Thanks for joining us. I, I really just wanted to start by saying thank you to everyone that was a part of our Easter egg hunt uh, yesterday. Uh, really thankful for Roxanne and her husband Arun and just their leadership in that. Uh, so, so many of you volunteered as well, and it was just wonderful to see so many families and to be outside in the sun. Uh, and it's always fun at those events for me because sometimes people will come up to me and thank me for the event that I had nothing to do with at all, right? And so I was like, well, um, you have to thank somebody else because I had nothing to do th with this. I was just a dad chasing four kids yesterday, and it was great, uh, and just opportunity to share the gospel with people, and we're just praising God for that and looking forward uh, to the rest of this Easter season. Uh, we're looking forward to Good Friday, 7 p.m. this Friday, and then Easter Sunday as well. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. We're going to be in Luke 19, primarily in verses 28 through 44 uh, this morning. And if you are a guest with us, welcome. Maybe you're checking us out online. And, and we just always want uh, to let those that are guests with us know uh, that we believe that the Bible is, is the inspired Word of God. Uh, we believe that it's supposed to be the very foundation of our lives. It's how God has revealed himself to us so we can walk in obedience to him. And, and so we don't really believe that what I have to say today matters very much unless it agrees with what God has said. And so that's why we encourage you to open your Bibles, get it on an app on your phone so you can see what God's word says for yourself. We want to be a church that takes God's word seriously, and we try not to take ourselves too seriously. And, and case in point, uh, yesterday my, my, my daughter came up to me and she had a plan. And my daughter said, Daddy, we need to wear our matching socks to church tomorrow. And I was like, okay. Um, quick thing, our matching socks are frozen socks, okay? And it's almost April and, um, and, and I have frozen socks on today because um, that's how good I am at saying no to uh, my daughter, um, and so um, if, if this is the best sermon that you've ever heard, it's probably the socks, um, just so you know, right from the beginning, we try not to take ourselves too seriously, we take God's word seriously, and we're looking at Luke 19 today, and this well-known story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, a and Jesus made a habit of showing up in unexpected ways and at unexpected times. I and mean, you can just think back, of course, to his birth. And, and just imagine if you were in Bethlehem and you actually knew what was going on at the time. And so you run up to your friend and you're like, you will never believe it. God is here. <laughs> God is here. Your friend's like, no way. Can we see him? Yes. Right after his mom finishes feeding him because he's a baby, right? Not how you would expect God to show up. You wouldn't expect him to be a baby, but that's how Jesus shows up to this earth. He, he enters into our, into our world in a place where animals feed, right? Just crazy. During his earthly ministry, he showed up to Lazarus' house four days after Lazarus had already died. Like, Jesus, your timing here is a little off. He, he, he walked on the water out to his disciples. He just constantly was showing up in unexpected ways. And his arrival to Jerusalem in, in what's known as the triumphal entry was pretty unique as well. Let me give you the setting of what's going on here. It was Passover week, which means that thousands of animals were going to be sacrificed in Jerusalem, but none of them. None of them were sufficient to take away our sin. They were simply temporary coverings. And so year after year, insufficient sacrifices had to be altered, had to be offered. But on this Passover, five days after the events we are studying today, the perfect, sufficient for all sacrifice, Jesus would, would die for my sins and would die for your sins in our place. We, we saw last week that this is why Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. Not because he thought he was going to receive a crown, but because he knew he had to carry his cross. Not, not because Jesus enjoyed pain or had some sort of supernatural pain tolerance, but for the glory of God and because of his love for us. He, he had tried to prepare for his disciples 
for what was going to take place when they reached Jerusalem. Three different times he had predicted his death, including uh, just back in Luke 18, just detailed everything that was going to happen for them, and they still didn't get it. Its meaning was hidden from their eyes. And, and so as we, as we come to this passage this morning, I just want to put our cards on the table. Okay, We believe that Jesus is king. Just so you know, we believe that Jesus is king. And, and I hope that we don't just say that in a symbolic sense. We, we don't just believe in this divine figurehead that we have to pay our respects to every once in a while and then go on our merry way and live life however we want. No, when we say that Jesus is king, we are saying that we believe that he has all authority. We, we're saying that we believe that, that he reigns, not, not just on a heavenly throne, but that he rules over all. That there is nowhere that you can go where his sovereignty does not reach. And so our goal this Easter season is just to fix our eyes on our king. We, we want to walk in the steps that he has laid out for us. And we want our expectations to align with his purposes. Because so many people are frustrated with God because they are expecting him to fulfill promises that he never made. You realize that? So many people, they get so frustrated with God because their expectation is that he's going to do something for them that God never promised to do. Or we get frustrated with God for doing exactly what he promised that he would do. Or for something that happened that he, that he warned us would come. And, and so we're going to dive into we're going to dive into this passage today, and, 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 and we are doing so recognizing that if our praise for our king is going to be persistent instead of short-lived, then we must both see the greatness of the person of Jesus as well as the greatness of the purpose of Jesus. I want to see the greatness of the person of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus. And so I want us to get the whole picture of what's happening in this text. And so I'm going to read verses 28 through 40, and then we're going to walk back through it together. Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, says this, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Duh. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and he, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Uh, I want us to acknowledge, as we, as we jump into this, from the outset, that, that this is a pretty strange scene that is unfolding before us. It's certainly not something that happens every day. And, and, and just the fact that Jesus is making a public entrance into Jerusalem at all is noteworthy because this is a dangerous appearance for Jesus based on how you and I would define the word danger. This, this is a dangerous appearance. The Pharisees at this point were already actively seeking for an opportunity to kill Jesus. John 11 tells us that orders had been given for his arrest. He was a wanted man. And, and if you want to know what his crime was, his crime really was just making the religious leaders look bad. 
and, and threatening their power and threatening their prestige. I mean, how dare he do that? And so, of course, rather than repenting of their pride and pretentiousness, the Pharisees instead wanted to kill the man for exposing them. That's the way you solve your problems. If you want an idea of how badly they wanted Jesus dead, they were also seeking to kill Lazarus just because Jesus was the one who raised him from the dead. So, so this is how spiritually blinding pride is. You, you can't deny that someone was raised from the dead, but rather than believing, you decide, let's just kill that guy too. Okay, this is, the, this is the pride of the Pharisees. That was their plan. And so Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and he is a wanted man. And I don't know a lot about how to operate when there's a warrant out from, for your arrest, because I haven't had a lot of practice at that. But, but one thing I do know, because Pastor John told me, is that if, you want, if you're wanted in a city, it's probably not in your best interest to go to that city via parade, okay? Like, it, it, uh, just a word of advice, I haven't had to try this yet, but if you, in case you ever have to, I, I don't think the best solution for going to a city where you, there's a warrant out for your arrest is to go so with a processional, via parade. I think you might want to keep a slightly lower profile than that, but this is what Jesus does, right? Jesus, knowing that the plan is for him to be killed, and he says, how about a grand entrance? Let, let's do it this way, which I think is a pretty boss move by Jesus, don't you? This is a pretty boss move. No fear, nothing to hide at all, not trying to sneak in the back door. He doesn't just go to Jerusalem. He makes sure his entrance is announced because his purpose wasn't to stay on the down low. His purpose was to be lifted up, was to be lifted up. And, and we know from John's account that this only motivated the Pharisees more because they said the whole world's starting to go after him. And, and so while the entry of Jesus was public, and it did cause quite a commotion, I, I also don't want us to get the wrong idea. This triumphal entry was by no means adequate. It was not fit for a king. Jesus took an unfitting ride to Jerusalem. This is not, as you read this passage, how a coronation for a king is supposed to work. Coronations are not unplanned. They are not spontaneous. They are not humble. They're not unofficial. They're not superficial. And they are not temporary. This was not some formal event. There weren't any public officials and dignitaries there waiting to welcome them. There wasn't all the pomp and the circumstance. It was so much less than what Jesus deserved. And Jesus, at this point, as he's riding into Jerusalem, still had two true coronations in front of him. His heavenly coronation, Philippians 2, where God highly exalts him, gives him a name that's above every name, seats him at the right hand of God. And Jesus will have a true earthly coronation as well. And you can read about it in Revelation 19 because it's already been planned out. It's ready to go. But as he entered Jerusalem on this day, the proceedings were hardly sufficient. And we have to talk about the animal that Jesus rode on for a minute. Luke tells us about the colt that had never been ridden before. Wasn't even prepared for this at all. We, we, we know that there was also a grown donkey walking alongside. Uh, Jesus did not ride on both at the same time. He could have ridden on both uh, since a young colt might not have been strong enough to carry him the whole way. Hadn't done its exercises yet. Wasn't prepared for that. Uh, we're not sure, but I'll tell you what we do know for sure. Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, didn't ride into Jerusalem on a great horse. This would be like a president showing up for his inauguration day, but instead of being in a big limo, he's on a moped. Okay? Just wouldn't fit the scene. There's something wrong with this here. Okay? Jesus is just riding on this, on this young cold that never had anyone on him 
before. This was not a ride fit for royalty. But in arriving on this young donkey, he fulfilled the words of Zechariah. This is what it said in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt. The foal of a donkey. And while we need to recognize that Jesus is fulfilling prophecy here, uh, I, I think that sometimes we can talk about Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy in a way that almost gives the impression that Jesus was just walking around with a copy of the Old Testament and, and just doing whatever, whatever it said the Messiah would do. All right, okay, what do I have to do next? Okay, I'll go here and then do this. And, and that's not the picture that we should have when we think about Jesus. It's not like Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem, brushing up on Zechariah, right? And he gets to Zechariah 9.9 9 and he stops. What's the matter, Jesus? This can't be right. What? Um, I think I need a donkey. Like, that, that, that's not how this went down. I, I think the impression that Jesus was just was just going around making sure he fulfilled these prophecies is probably based on our minds thinking chronologically. But the reality is Jesus wasn't beholden to the prophets. The prophets were beholden to him. Jesus wasn't mirroring the prophets. The prophets were foreshadowing him. The reason Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies is because the prophets were writing about Jesus. And so the reason that Jesus rode on a donkey wasn't just to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. The reason that Zechariah foretold Jesus entering on a young colt is because Jesus was coming in humility. He was coming in humility, worthy of the greatest stallion, but willing to be seated on an unprepared young donkey. And despite his lowly transportation, the crowd was ready. The crowd was ready to give him high praise. Look at verse 36, 37. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And they were right. They were right. But, but there's this question that sort of lingers over this text, and I, and I find it just impossible to ignore. And, it, and it's how could this true and, and genuine worship be given to a man who days later would hear cries of crucify him, crucify him. And, and to be fair, we don't know how much overlap there was between this crowd and the angry mob on Friday. But, but one conclusion that I believe is safe to make is that there was a misunderstood purpose to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. A misunderstood purpose. Uh, ma many know the chorus of the multitude's praise song that day. Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And Hosanna means save now. Save now. There, there was a sense of urgency in this petition. Uh, Jesus, you are the one that we have been waiting for. You are the one who can set us free. You can reestablish the throne of David. You can set us free from the oppression of the Romans. And they knew that they knew that the king was coming, but I think what was misunderstood is that Jesus wasn't coming to make political war. He was coming to make spiritual peace. Not political war, but spiritual peace. And before we get too hard on the crowd here, we should recognize how often we do the same thing to Jesus. We correctly, maybe at least mentally, uh, assess, we correctly assess his attributes, right? We, we say that we believe that Jesus is powerful. We, we, we say that we believe that he's in control. We say that we believe that he is just, but we misunderstand his priorities. 
We, we, we miss his purpose. Hey, how often, do in, in the way that we live, in the way that we pray, do we say that we want Jesus to be in charge as long as he does what we would do if we were in charge? Isn't that what we do? Jesus, I want you to be in charge as long as you do this, 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 and this, which is what I would do if, if I was in charge. We think we have a better plan. We think we have better purposes for Jesus to use his attributes in our life, right? So how often do we say, Jesus, save now and bring physical healing? Save now and bring financial stability. Save now and bring political change. Save now and provide a spouse. Save now and make my life easier. Now, do we have a God who brings physical healing? Yes. Does he care about our health and our finances and our relationships? Of course he does. But if your praise is motivated by a desire to bring a physical or a material change in your life, then you are missing out on the better and ultimate purpose of Jesus. Uh, one line that Becca and I say a lot as parents that wasn't in that, pro that parenting brochure that you read before you sign up for all of this, wasn't in there. Um, but this is something that we say. We say, that's not its purpose. Right? That's not its purpose, because our kids like to use things for something other than what it was intended for. Uh, Zayden loves to go into our pots and our pans and just spread them out across the kitchen floor and then sit in them. And I take a picture first, because, I mean, it's kind of cute. But, but, but then I tell him, you, you, you know, that we have more comfortable options than a pot, right? Like, there's something in the other room. It's called a couch. Your sister's using it as a trampoline right now, but it's like so much more comfortable than where you're sitting. You're, you're missing out. Uh, if, 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 if you want Jesus to be your king, but just to watch over your physical needs, that, that's like buying an iPhone and only using it as a calculator. It's like buying a car just so you can have a cup holder. Jesus can do so much more than just watch over our physical needs. He came to meet our spiritual needs. If you expect Jesus to value your external situation more than your internal heart condition, then you are setting yourself up for so much disappointment in your walk with Jesus. Because his priorities are different. Your, your praise for him isn't going to last very long because he can do so much more than just meet your temporary needs. He came to meet your eternal needs. And so I don't just want us to see the strangeness of this triumphal entry scene. I, I want this passage to give us a clearer view of who our king is and his purpose in coming. Because this was not just a strange entrance, it was also an insightful entrance. Uh, there's all sorts of insights in this text that can teach us more about Jesus. And the first that I want us to see is that Jesus is a sovereign king. He's a sovereign king. There, there's all sorts of different things in this text that point to the sovereignty of Christ that would just be easy to miss. Uh, just, he is totally in control in this situation. Uh, he, he knew that he was walking towards his death. He, he knew that his public arrival would accelerate that process so he could be the Passover lamb just in time. But if we're being honest here, lots of people could, could set things up to knowingly walk towards their death. Only a sovereign king could walk towards his death and resurrection. And that's our king. As they approached the city, Jesus knew where there would be a donkey in the village in front of him that, that had never been ridden before. He, he just knew that. And, and it's not like he had to scope out the area ahead of time. He's in control. He's sovereign over the details. He knew that the owners would ask, um, what are you doing with my donkey? Right? What are you doing with my colt? And he knew exactly what they needed to say. Just say, the Lord has need of it. And then they probably walked away. The disciples walked away saying, I cannot believe that that worked. The Lord has need of it. We'll see you later. Okay. So Luke tells us in verse 37, 
why the crowds were praising Jesus. They were praising him because of his sovereignty, because of the mighty works they had seen. This window into the sovereignty of Jesus. He had shown that he was sovereign over sickness. He's sovereign over disease, over blindness and leprosy. He's sovereign over the wind and the waves. He was even sovereign over death. As he was entering Jerusalem, he was coming from the home of Lazarus. He just had a meal there with a man who used to be dead, but Jesus raised back to life. And a week from now, he was going to reveal that he is even sovereign over his own grave. So, so the crowd knows that what Jesus has done, and, and they believed. They believed that he was a sovereign king. They believed that he was going to establish his kingdom where he ruled and reigned. And they were right. They misunderstood the timing, but they were right. And so they start to praise him. And Jesus was deserving of their adoration because he's not only a sovereign king, he is also a worthy king. I always like to point out evidence that, that Jesus was truly God and that he claimed to be exactly that. Because one criticism that some people will make about Jesus, is other religions will say that he never claimed to be God. And if you read the Gospels, that's simply not true. It's all over the place when you look for it. And so along those lines, one detail of this story that we shouldn't overlook is that Jesus accepts and validates the praise he was receiving from the crowd. And we should pay attention as we read the Gospels to all the times that Jesus says that it is right to value him and that it is right to honor him. Think about when he was at Mary and Martha's house for dinner. And Martha is frustrated because instead of helping her host, Mary is sitting with Jesus. He says, Jesus, help me out here. Tell my sister to help me. And Jesus says, no, actually, being with me is more important than you being helped right now. Her honoring me is Right. Another time, Mary pours this crazy expensive perfume on Jesus and washes her feet, washes his feet with her hair, which would make a lot of people, including me, uncomfortable. Right? Like this, I don't deserve this. And, and the disciples were even frustrated. Like, what a waste. What a waste. This could have been used for something so much better than this. And if it were anyone else, they would have a point. But Jesus says, no, 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 this is right. This is right. I am worth this. Think about the time that a man came and said to Jesus that he wanted to follow him. And Jesus said, great, first go and sell everything that you have. And then come and follow me, right? So, so if you're going to follow me, you have to be all in. If you're going to follow me, you have to value me more than you value your stuff. And anyone other than Jesus says something like that, and you would say, who do you think you are? Like, like what is your problem? I'm just telling you, if you come up to me after the service and say that in order for me to be your friend, I have to sell my house, you need to find a different friend, right? I'm not doing that. I'm, not do I'm like, nope, I'm going to keep my house and find a different friend. Anyone other than Jesus and saying, sell everything you have and follow me, would be crazy. But Jesus is not anyone else. He is king over all. He deserves all of our praise, and all of our devotion, and all of our lives, because he is worthy. There is no gift that you give, and no song of praise that you can sing, that Jesus is not worthy to receive. Our acts of worship will never exceed his supreme value. And so as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, riding on this unbroken donkey, the people start to just roll out the red carpet. A spontaneous worship service breaks out. The people appropriate Psalm 118 to Jesus, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Save now. And the unbelieving Pharisees are like, Jesus, you need to stop this. You can't let them worship you. 
This blasphemy needs to stop. And Jesus says, if they stop now, the rocks will sing the second verse. How amazing is that? Look at it. It's verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're worshiping you. They're only supposed to worship God. What are they doing? He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Because the whole design of the universe was to praise the king. All things were created by him and for him, that in everything he might have preeminence. The heavens were created to declare the glory of God. So if people fail to fulfill their purpose, Jesus will see to it that the rocks will. We can see his sovereignty here as well, by the way. Jesus is not lacking for worshipers. Jesus does not need us. We need him. So if you want to give your pride a reality check, which I know some of you were so anxious for this morning, right? So if you want to give your pride a reality check, consider this. If we don't fulfill the ultimate purpose of our lives, which is to glorify Jesus, then he can just have a rock do it instead. Doesn't that make you feel good about yourself, right? He can just have a rock do what you're supposed to do. I'm sure it's a really big rock, though, okay? Probably a boulder, so feel better. But Jesus doesn't just deserve the appreciation of a few. He is, he is worthy of all creation joining together to praise his name. And, and I want us to see one more insight. And, and it's from the passage right after verse 40, right after the triumphal entry. Look at verse 41 of chapter 19. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. I want us to know that Jesus is a sovereign king, a worthy king, and a merciful king. Jesus has finally arrived at his destination. The week that stood in front of him is the reason that Jesus came to this earth. And as he is looking out over the city of Jerusalem, he, he knows that the people in this city are going to be responsible for his unlawful death. And he knows that in a few years, the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And in this moment, Jesus weeps, not for himself, but for them. And I just find this passage fascinating because how merciful do you have to be to look over a group of people that you created, a group of people that God chose to be his own, and to know that they are going to reject your rightful kingship and instead treat you like the worst of criminals, and you are going to suffer and die at the hands of these people that you have made. And instead of turning his back and, and going to another town, instead of being filled with anger and vengeance, Jesus' response is to weep tears of mercy. His longing for them and his longing for us was to know true peace. This, this is why Jesus came to this earth this is why Jesus willingly entered the city that was going to reject him because we didn't just need political peace or national peace. We need peace with God. So Jesus left the unending worship of angels in heaven to receive the fleeting worship in this broken world. Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I failed to live. He fulfilled the law that we failed to fulfill. He demonstrated that the prophets were written about him, that he is the Messiah, the rightful heir to the throne of David, worthy of all the praise that all of creation can muster. But because we needed a perfect Passover lamb to be sacrificed, 
Instead of receiving a golden crown, King Jesus received a crown of thorns. In the ultimate display of sovereign mercy, he died the death that you and I deserve to die. He took the punishment for all of our sin on himself at the cross. But because he is sovereign over life and over death, he rose from the dead. He conquered sin and the grave. So if you place your faith in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus, all of your sins can be forgiven. You don't have to stand before a holy God on the basis of your resume because the righteousness of Jesus can be credited to your account. You can become part of the eternal family of God. You can experience true and lasting eternal peace. And it's because Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem for his name to be lifted up in praise. He came to Jerusalem for his body to be lifted up on a cross. He didn't come to simply be our physical king or our monetary king or our material king. No, his purpose was so much greater than that. Jesus came to be our spiritual king, to, to reign in our hearts through faith. And he is the only way, the only way for you to have true peace in your life. And I want you to see that this Easter season. I want you to see that as as glorious. I I want you to see that, that the person of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus. I don't want that to be hidden from your eyes like it was for the people in Jerusalem. And so as we conclude this triumphal entry and we look forward to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, this is my question for you. Can you see the purpose of the king? Can you see the greatness? Can you see the goodness? Can you see the glory of his purpose? Because how sad would it be? I think there's so many people. How sad would it be to identify who Jesus is? but not identify with his true purpose. To not recognize that he can do so much more than just meet our physical longings. He can meet our spiritual needs. He came to transform us from the inside out. He came to bring freedom from your sin so he can reign in your heart. And if our praise is going to be persistent instead of fleeting, then we need to see the glory of the person of Christ and the glory of the purpose of Christ. That he came to make a way for us to come to him just as we are. Let me pray for us, and Bob's going to sing about that truth. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would see our king today. That we would see him high and lifted up. That we would see the greatness of your person and the greatness of your purpose. God, I pray that we wouldn't try to limit Jesus to just our physical longings, but that we would surrender all of ourselves, that we would surrender our hearts to you, that we would want you to rule and to reign, because you're so much better, you're so much better, and we need you. We desperately need you. So I pray that you would be honored and that you would be glorified and that our praise would be persistent instead of fleeting because we align our expectations with your purposes. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.